Great, Gary. Go ahead and uh, go ahead and kick us off whenever you're ready. <clears throat> I think we should um, we should take data verse one and fly it around the world and visit everyone. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, uh, we're we're really thrilled that you are here in a certain sense, um, and uh, we look forward to being together in person when when that becomes feasible. Um, uh, I, I wanted to ask. Um, how many of you remember a few years ago when I gave this introductory talk and threw marshmallows at everybody? Um, I don't think you can shake your head because I can't see you, but in, in any event, um, the, the moral of that story was that um, this group understands, uh, oh good, yeah, so there's some chats. So uh, that, that moral of, the moral of that story was that this group understands improving inf infrastructure and doing it together um, and that that can be far more impactful than almost any other way of contributing. But you're willing to deal with the fact that, that when somebody gets data from Dataverse that you helped, helped create, uh, improve, and, and spread, and correct bugs from, and, uh, and contribute to in many other ways, they don't cite you. They don't cite you in the articles. They don't cite you in the patents that are created. They don't cite you in the lectures. They don't cite you or me in the in, in other scholarship. Nobody gives a Nobel Prize for data archiving, and we very rarely appear in the newspapers for almost anything at all. Um, perhaps your parents are like my mom, who calls me up every once in a while and says, "So tell me one more time, what is this dataverse thing really?" <laughs> you know? um, and, and you're okay with that because we know. Uh, you know, we know, I know that working together on deep infrastructure can have these massive effects. Um, there's, there are in fact very few areas where you could have a bigger impact than, than you can by contributing uh, in the way we, we do together. Uh, it, isn't, it isn't known to everybody, but you know, we deal with that. Um, that's sort of who we are. Um, uh, we have, however, had an impact on almost every important major discovery across the social sciences and increasingly in many other areas. Think about just the social sciences. A few decades ago, the evidence base of the social sciences was based upon just three things. It was, it was survey research, um, end of year government uh, or end of period government statistics and one-off studies of people or places or events. Um, that was very informative, but that was, so that was pretty much all the data we had. Um, why was it? Well, because we couldn't really handle more innovative data. Even if we could figure out how to analyze it in the computers that were available then, we could never assure that any other scholar could ever do the same thing, could ever access the same data, could ever follow in our footsteps, could ever improve on what we did, could ever check, check what, what we did. Um, we could do some of the analysis that is, but we couldn't do science. And because science is not just individuals acting scientifically, it requires different people to analyze the same data in comp competition and cooperation in pursuit of the same goals. Without that, you don't, you don't have science and therefore you don't have basically um, all of the progress that humanity has made as a result of it. Um, and pretty much all progress has come from this, this whole endeavor, um, at least in the last 400 years or so. Um, <clears throat> since we started Dataverse, which doesn't go back 400 years, but nevertheless, um, we've helped facilitate a massive increase, um, not only in the amount of data, but the diversity of types of data that, we, that, 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 that people can work on. So yeah, there's more surveys and more government statistics and more one-off studies of people, places, or events, but now there's images and there's text as data and there's social media data. And there's satellite imagery with ge geographic information sy systems and cell phone tower data and genetic data and on and on and on and on. We can handle so much more. Uh, uh, just in Dataverse, uh, we can handle all of these and many other types of, types of information. And the science then gets advanced as a result. And the result, just in the social sciences, has been spectacular. Um, uh, the social sciences have altered friendship networks, um, uh, changed political campaigns, uh, influenced public health, um, legal analysis, policing, economics, sports, sports. My students now get offers from, from sports teams. Um, 
uh, public policy um, literature. Uh, um, there's whole new industries that have been established using the kinds of analyses that are uh, developed to analyze the data that we that we make available. Um, governments now encourage people to, to to share data and require their their offices and and um, agencies to do so. Um, this is so different from when we got started with this project that the past is almost unrecognizable. And I think we should just take a moment to, to really realize the impact we've had on the world in this way. I mean, think about replication, right? So that data verse, which data verse facilitates. I mean, the importance of this is, 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 is essential to science. I mean, replication is not about catching any, anybody in a mistake. It's not really, that's not particularly interesting. It doesn't happen that often that people either make mistakes and, or fraud or anything like that. Yeah, there's some great spectacular cases that, that we all know about, but, but those are the real exceptions. Um, uh, really what it is, is what replication is, is getting up to the cutting edge. Um, if you can, if you want to advance what other people have done, the first thing you have to do is get up to the cutting edge. How do you do that? You can't do it by just reading an article. If you read the article, you get to see the advertising for what was done. You don't get to see the thousands of data analytic decisions that were apparently too small to fit into the publication. You need to get the replication data set. Once you're there, once you can redo the analysis and, and, and get up to get up to the same point that the, that the original scholar had when they, when they, when they made it, um, then, you can, then you can advance. Before Dataverse, it was really hard to get data from another author, really hard. Let me give you an example. Um, I've been asking my students to replicate articles in class as a class project since I started teaching a decade before I wrote Replication, Replication in 1995. Back then, um, I'd say 80% of the students would go out, find an article, try to obtain the data and fail to get the data and therefore fail to replicate the article. And they were, they, they, they couldn't believe it, right? I mean, the, these, were, these were articles by famous authors published in the best scholarly journals, uh, um, but um, uh, they come from the, from the best universities and nobody could replicate their results, which means that nobody could build on their results, which means nobody could trust their results, which means what, was the, what is the point of all this exactly, right? And the students were, they just couldn't believe it. And, and actually that was the main lesson I wanted to convey to them. Like, you can't do this. And, and therefore, what can you trust about the scholarly literature? Um, by the way, the, the remaining 20% where they could do it, most of those were people who would get articles um, which analyze some of the major, uh, the major surveys like the national election studies or the GSS or things like that. And, and you know, that, that they, they were careful about, about, about archiving. Today, in my class, students go to Dataverse, they download, when they get this assignment, because they, they always get this assignment, um, they go to Dataverse, they download a replication data file from whatever article they want. Um, they're not all there yet, but quite a lot of them are. And they're ready to go in a few hours. Like they've gotten up to the cutting edge. These are first year graduate students. They can get up to the cutting edge of the literature. They can get up to where the best scholars have gotten in, in, in a few hours. Um, the students now spend most of their time um, <clears throat> and most of the semester in actually advancing science, pushing forward the state of the literature. I mean, they have the time, they have the bandwidth, and because of us, they have the data. Um, they learn more. They're much more likely to publish their class papers. You know, more than half of my, my students just in my, in my own little class wind up publishing their class papers in a scholarly journal. That's only because of what Dataverse has, has produced. And of course, it's not just my class. It's hundreds, of, it's hundreds of other classes. And I think the world benefits as a result also. We're turning students into, into um, uh, into contributing professionals, even, at, even while they're students. Um, of course, it isn't only students. It's what I do when I do research. The first thing I do when I go into a new area is go get the best articles and replicate them. Again, not to just, not to find mistakes in what they did, but to understand what they did, to figure out how to build on their, to build on their research. Um, and I can, get the, I can get to the cutting edge of many more research projects uh, before I choose a direction much, much faster. I mean, these advances happened 
because of what you all do, uh, because of what we all do together. So please, if you have some time, don't only eat marshmallows, call up my mom and tell her that there's something to write home about. It really matters. What you all do really, really matters. So thanks for coming and I look forward to hearing what you all have to say. Take care. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, always so inspirational and so true, everything you say. <laughs> what do you say? Uh, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to see the community joining um, and that and going strong as, al as always, uh, as every year. Uh, today, at this time, this year is a special year for me uh, to, to join as both uh, an insider and an outsider. So I've been an insider of the Dataverse community for since Dataverse started. And many of you know me uh, since 2006, where we launched it and look at how much progress we've made. Uh, it is, it, well, the data shows it, but <laughs> also the... the um, well, the strength of, of the community and, uh, and everybody sharing where uh, they are coming, uh, joining from, so from so many places in the world shows that too. Uh, so so that, that is great this time. Uh, as I think many of you know, now I'm the secretary, I'm not, uh, well, the secretary of um, transparency of open government uh, for the government of Catalonia. And as Gary pointed out, the governments are, are getting increasingly involved also in, in sharing the data, uh, making the government more accountable, making uh, the, um, well, uh, fostering open data within their uh, the countries, uh, not only from the uh, data from the administration, but also making it more uh, accessible uh, for researchers uh, and um, for others in, uh, to be able to just understand, first be well informed about uh, what they do, but also to be able to do research from it. That's uh, and so we're, uh, this community, I think, will understand. Uh, it's not a, when we talk about research data or when we talk about data. Uh, Gary also pointed out it's not just the traditional data as we understood it some years ago. It's all kinds of data and includes uh, data from many sources. So, but but we. Uh, in this session, we go even beyond data, and that's an, uh, an exciting part of it. So when we're, we're talking about research, it's not only uh, the data that it needs to be shared, and when we're talking about replication, and we're talking about understanding and building up on what others have done, it's not only data, but it's also the entire research uh, workflow, the entire um, the, the code that goes along with the data to be able to uh, reproduce the results. Um, and, and make that not only open, but make it, uh, as, we, as we say, fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So the talks in this session are going to be about these topics, and, and the experts on these areas are here, and I'm really, really delighted that they join us today in this session. So we will start, I'll introduce each one as uh, um, just before their talk, but we have um, Carol Goebel, Dan Katz, and Herbert Ben Sampo here. And, and first, we're going to start with Carol, dear friend and dear collaborator. <laughs> hi, Carol, uh, joining us from the UK. Hi. Uh, hi. So, uh, Carol is a professor at the University of Manchester, and she, she now leads the UK node of Elixir, is the European Research Infrastructure for Life Science Data, and also co leads Elixir's European. Open Science Cloud the US activities, and in particular in the FAIR workflows, um, and also is part of the workflow hub.eu that some of you already have seen. Uh, and it, well, it's, it's really been, uh, um, I, would, I would say, one of the main experts in workflows, in research workflows, especially if applied to life sciences, but they could be applied to many other, uh, any aspects of research or many um, disciplines. And here is to talk today about workflows. <laughs> so, <laughs> Carol, uh, the Thank, thank you very much. Yours. I'll share my screen and I will hide you away, let's say, so you don't distract me when you're trying to stop me speaking, which almost certainly you will. 
Okay, so thank you very much, I must say, for um, inviting me to speak at this meeting. And uh, Mase asked me to talk about uh, two topics in a short period of time on workflows and uh, research objects. And, uh, and so that's what I'm going to attempt to do within the context of um, a big European infrastructure. And I understand Gary's passion there. Um, so the European Open Science Cloud Life Project is one of these pan-national um, data and method thematic commonses that we build in uh, Europe. This one's particularly for the biosciences, uh, for data and, and methods. And the idea here is that we bring together all sorts of uh, data repositories, uh, computational frameworks, different kinds of researchers in order to be able to make their tools more interoperable, for them to be able to uh, develop workflows. I'll mention what, what workflows are uh, in a meeting in case you're not quite sure, but basically share their data, share their infrastructure and make it cloudified. Basically, how do we share and use data um, tools and workflows in the cloud? And this one has 13 research infrastructures. It's enormous. It's got several hundred many hundreds of um, institutions associated with it. Um, so it's a heroic effort. It's also an infrastructure zoo. So uh, when you look in, for example, Fair Sharing, which is a library for um, uh, metadata standards and databases and life sciences and others, you'll find that there are actually nearly 1500 data repositories and archives operating in the life science sector and over 900 different data formats and metadata standards. So this sounds great. Let's put all this uh, stuff together. Let's put it in the cloud and put on a show, except that we're operating in quite a diverse and federated system. And we have to flow information around it from the primary data sets into secondary sources, uh, gen general repositories like Zenodo, or perhaps Dataverse, um, aggregators to feed registries and applications and analysis engines and so on. And that is not even including institutional or national repositories like uh, Dataverse. That's just the, the, uh, the repositories of the community. And we go from compounds to clinical trials. So it's quite extreme, this. So we have the challenges of uh, moving um, data around what we might call community enclaves, you know, sort of private or, or community uh, developed uh, um, infrastructure platforms, of which there are many. So this, this is not greenfield. There's a bunch of data sets. There's a bunch of computational platforms. Um, it's many are actually within national sovereignties where data cannot move across uh, national borders or even out of institutions, particularly for uh, clinical data. So how do we manage this? And, um, and how do we work with this? Well, one mechanism is to use computational workflows as an entry point and as an integration mechanism. So that's uh, what we're trying to do. So computational workflows are effectively multi-step uh, processes here. So I'm not talking about um, the workflows that are lab protocols. Um, I'm talking about computational uh, workflows here. So for example, we have workflows in cryo um, electron electron microscopy, we have metagenomic pipelines, we have drug discovery pipelines, uh, these metagenomic pipelines have sub pipelines. So this is the processing pipelines and analysis pipelines and simulation pipelines that every one of these uh, research infrastructures use in their structural bioinformatics or metagenomics or um, uh, translational medicine. And a real example here uh, one that is very much in our minds for the last year is SARS uh, processing, monitoring and analysis. So this is a, a schematic of a pipeline built using the computational uh, workflow system called Galaxy. It's a little picture of what uh, the Galaxy workflows look like here, um, which takes in uh, data at national levels and uh, community source levels at the European nucleotide archive, it's all part of something called the COVID data portal, does monitoring analysis. It does this every three hours, analyzes uh, what the current data situation is. Um, those pipelines, those processing pipelines, then produce data, which is then shared 
into uh, national repositories and into national data boards, uh, dashboards and interactive notebooks. So this is the kind of thing that we're, we're doing. And these workflows, such as the Galaxy workflow, speak to the things that Gary was talking about, which is to do with um, method scrutiny. So you can see what those processing method methods are. And uh, we're able to um, have quality control over those, those methods because computational workflows are really method objects to be shared and ported and reused and repurposed, but also to be scrutinized and also to expose the transparency of the processing. And we have found problems that people have, have uh, published workflows, particularly in the SARS area, which frankly were wrong, but I won't get into those, um, those details there. So this is what a computational workflow really is. It's multi-step, it leverages third-party code. So it's a powerful uh, multiplier um, of the community's know-how. Um, workflow management systems um, typically support scalable processing of the data and it is transparent research. It's a kind of special kind of software and Dan will talk all about software shortly. But the key thing is that in a workflow system, there's an attempt to separate the workflow specification from its execution. So we have a, a specification description, which is the precise description of the procedure and the inputs and outputs and the flow of the data. And uh, then the execution, which is the workflow engine, which interprets that and orchestrates the, the codes that, are, that will make up the steps and the codes and the tools themselves that are the steps. So that's the actual execution where the data is consumed and produced uh, by each of those codes. And so there's two kinds of software associated with a workflow system, workflow engine and the tools and codes that it um, operates over. Now, of course, there's a zoo of these too. So um, there's at least in, in uh, our platform, there's um, Skypeon and Galaxy and some random scripts and SnakeMake and NextFlow and Jupyter Notebooks are also another kind of workflow system in a way. And they have their native repositories, often based on GitHub, usually almost nearly always based on GitHub. Um, there's about uh, 280 um, active workflow management systems currently in operation. So just to, to re-emphasize again, this is uh, the uh, magnify metagenomic pipelines that uh, I mentioned a bit earlier. You have inputs, you have outputs, and those steps might be command line tools, sub workflows, so workflows in their own, you know, uh, other workflows and uh, in containers. There are also Another part of them being beyond data is they are actually multi-part research objects because they have dependencies, obviously, because they're dependent upon their, um, their component steps, the codes that they're operating over, and they're associated with things. So the workflow itself has uh, maybe an image, parameters um, information, the inputs and output descriptions, documentation, the dependencies, of, of, it, of its execution, but it also has things like input data sets and output data sets. And if it's run, what are the runtime details? What test uh, engines can it bind to? Is it linked to other sub workflows? What publications is it associated with it? Who's the authors? Who, uh, what's the licenses? So all of these are components that make up the, uh, the workflow. And uh, they are often scattered across different repositories. Um, or even within repositories, the data is scattered, the, the uh, tools themselves are scattered in different places. Um, the, so all of these things can be, um, be held in many different places. So what we really needed in uh, our, our setting was services for fair workflows. So we need to be able to describe the workflows. We need to be able to move workflows between the services and the platforms, these legacy platforms. And we also need to be able to package together all those different parts many of which are scattered objects. Um, and we need to package them together and then package them, link them together by their context that this is associated with a particular workflow and why. Whilst all the time honoring the legacy and diversity of the ecosystem and getting buy-in from those platforms and as a nod um, to Herbert, to be kissy whilst we're doing it, keep it simple. So it had to be practical and developer friendly because it had to be quickly taken up. And there had to be a lot of open-endedness because we have a lot of diversity and a lot of unknown unknowns. So we have workflow systems, a workflow uh, testing environments. We have to, of course, get these things to work. 
And we also need a way of finding them. So a workflow registry. Hurrah, we built a workflow registry called Workflow Hub, which is a hub for workflows. It does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, so this is an open registry for workflows that's in perpetual development in the open by an open community. Why is it in perpetual development? Because we stood it up one year early be, in order to be able to handle the, the uh, COVID uh, crisis. Um, so we needed somewhere to be able to deposit uh, and register our, our COVID workflows. Um, so it's really towards fair workflows and, uh, and a fair registry in itself. So we can find workflows, but we keep the workflows in their native repositories wherever possible. You can deposit them, but we prefer that they're actually maintained in their native repositories. And we have a push and pull mechanism to get them into the registry. Um, and we use a metadata standards framework in order to be able to support them. Uh, the makers are the custodians of them. We don't have a curation team. So we have all sorts of infrastructure uh, mechanisms for organizing people, for organizing the workflows themselves, and also for giving credit for some of this and, and authors, which I won't go into here. Although it comes from the bio community, it's actually open to any topic. So here's a few pictures. Uh, here's some workflows that are, uh, these are all workflows to do with COVID actually. Uh, some are in Nextflow, some use the common workflow language, some use Galaxy, uh, and we use this standard called the Tools Registry Service API in order to be able to also, if you find something on the registry, you can just go run it. As it says here, run on, use Galaxy. If you find that workflow, you can automatically just jump to it and run it. And you can also view them back on their GitHub. I'll tell you what the download RO crate means in a moment. So one of the things that I want to nod to, to Dan is that uh, fair workflows are fair software. So they li are living and they have dependencies. They also have history and provenance because they will evolve. They will be versioned and updated. They will be executed and tested. They'll be downloaded and forked and remixed and cloned. So all the things that you might do with uh, software, you might do with work workflows because effectively they're modular, they're like Lego. Um, so we have to be able to support this in the workflow hub. So we have to have some sort of indicators of how stable we think workflows are. We have to register versions. We have to deal with incremental metadata. We have to link workflows with supplementary materials like their test data and publications. We have to be able to snapshot them and publish them, give them DOIs. Um, uh, we also have to, and, in, and we haven't done this yet, work on lifting out of workflows as they're uploaded potential sub workflows, but also do uh, workflow monitoring. Um, we also have uh, the issue that, of course, the workflows are objects that are actually multi-formed. Um, we have a specification. We have the implementation of that specification in the workflow management system. We have an instantiation of that implementation with all the input data and parameters to actually run it. Then we run it, and then we might want to record the final products and the, and the provenance logs of that, each of which of these is fair. So we need a, uh, or we need to talk about it being fair and we need to be able to record it in some way or maintain it. So we need a metadata framework that's extensible enough to cope. And in practice, this is all a bit, a bit blurry. So we had to develop a metadata framework in order to be able to support these workflows as fair digital objects. So we have standardized metadata about the workflows, uh, which we use schema.org for, because remember we had to be extensible open-endedness and uh, developer friendly. We have a canonical workflow description of the workflow itself. And we use the common workflow language for that, which is a community developer activity. And then the only uh, bio specific piece of all of that is an ontology for typing the inputs and outputs of the data formats of the steps which we have a particular ontology called EDAM. But uh, we also need to be able to cope with all those different parts as we move across from the systems, the workflow systems, into the registry, into the testing and monitoring and back again. So how are we going to exchange all of those components between the different services and parts? And how are we going to basically archive and share the components of those workflows? And we use something called Workflow RO crate for that. Uh, we crate up the workflows. 
And this is a specialization of the second thing that I wanted that Merce asked me to talk about, which was research objects uh, at RO Crate. Um, and in fact, an RO Crate means you can package all of these different components together and you could even put them into Dataverse. Hurrah! So let's step back. So um, RO Crate's been going quite a long time and its, and its predecessor, uh, the, the research object, has been going quite a long time. And it really comes from the observation that we deal with multiple parts when we do research. So we don't just deal with a piece of data or a data set, we do with many different things. Each will have its own metadata and its own repositories. And what we would quite like to do is have an integrated view and context over those fragmented resources when they're stored in different places. So we need a way of packaging all of that up to describe all of those different parts um, so that we can then uh, talk about it in an integrated kind of, of way when we're citing it or shipping it around or storing it or sharing it or archiving it. And we also might want to reference real things like people or mice or pieces of equipment. And we might want to package all of that up and put it in an archive or a repository like Dataverse as an, uh, as an archive or, or record of what we've been doing. And uh, this, is, this isn't just beyond data, this is also for data. So um, you could describe a data set as a digital object. Um, so um, this is, you want to be able to say, I, I want to have things that are local data, and I want to be able to address things that are external to me, outside of my local uh, data that are available because they have an addressable um, identifier. And so and we want to say things like who created this data, what parts does it have, can it be reused, which part of, uh, uh, is, it, is it part of which project and so on. So um, the data set can have um, uh, any kind of uh, data resource about anything in any format as, uh, as a file or a URL. So this is files you can locally have or URLs uh, scattered across potential repositories, each resource has a machine readable description in a JSON LD uh, and a human readable description that you could look at as HTML that lives alongside the metadata as well. Um, we can package together provenance and workflow information associated with data. Um, so we can put the data and the provenance uh, and the workflows and where it came from all together. And we can pack all these together using off the shelf um, uh, packaging environments like Bagit and zip and so on. So that's the idea behind RO Crate. So Stian, uh, my colleague, Stian Solaris, who will be talking um, later on in, in Dataverse meeting, wanted me to emphasize RO Crate is not just for workflows. It could be for any kind of object, including data repositories, especially data repositories. But the bottom line is you use it as a way of aggregating files, a URL, a URI addressable content and other RO crates, because they're addressable content, along with contextual information into citable um, objects that have their own metadata. And effectively, they can be like bags of references as well, which is handy when you need to point to large data sets or, or do uh, things like uh, uh, citation aggregation. And of course, we have the fair object and the fair content of the object. So this was just, a, I think it's just re-emphasizing again, these are unbounded, they, they reference uh, things. The key point of this slide though is that they're infrastructure independent. Um, so that means you can use them as a mechanism to exchange between repositories and registries and services and avoid uh, vendor locking. So that's what we used um, in our, uh, for our workflows in order to be able to move our workflows around our different uh, services. This is a, a kind of little uh, schematic about what a, a research object is. I won't go into the details here because I go, go along to Stian's talk on Thursday, but I did want to emphasize that it's lightweight and it's machine and human readable and it's developer friendly because it uses just JSON LD and schema and off the shelf uh, formatting. And it's described, um, it's self describing and it's typed by profiles, which means that it has an extensibility aspect. So you just add more schema.org and domain ontologies together if you want to elaborate further of what you expect to see in the research object, what you expect to be in the crate. 
So, uh, so it has a file and then it can, um, which describes the things in it, which could be files or directories or links to other things. So I won't go into Carol, the detail. Carol, uh, one minute. Uh, okay, reminder. right. I'm just coming okay. up now to the end. You're doing great. You're doing uh, great. So, um, so we have lots of variants of these, of course, because profiles are extensible. So, uh, and the RO creates kind of collect metadata as they go, uh, um, depending on what's in them, they can describe themselves and they can also describe uh, they can also have things in them which they don't describe because they don't care about it. So there's a whole kind of sea, a family of these RO crates now being developed. And these are really steps towards what we might call fair digital objects, which are a big thing in Europe at the moment around um, moving away from, from uh, data and moving towards the concept of a digital object um, of all different forms. They form the basis of the our improperability framework at the European level. And uh, I'll just have to, to skip over this bit that says that uh, we're, we're kind of using these, for example, um, as a mechanism of not only um, holding the workflows, but also holding the results of what you produce with the workflows. This is uh, a specimen, um, a physical specimen, which has a digital twin, which is actually a research object, is actually an RO crate. Um, which we then populate through um, image processing and other kinds of uh, digitization uh, using our workflows, which are also held as workflow RO crates. Terribly flexible, this technique. So to summarize, because I know that uh, Merce will now uh, pull me off. The first is, uh, well, what do we learn about that workout? Well, uh, real use cases are considered absolutely essential because there's quite a lot of infrastructure built without any real use cases. And uh, building, we built all of this, uh, this workflow infrastructure. We could build on workflow infrastructure that already existed, but we really uh, were able to use this RO crate as middleware with real examples. And um, the, making it developer friendly, making it straightforward to adopt really made a difference because the workflow systems could adopt it and start producing the metadata automatically because folks, people don't make metadata. You have to automatically generate it. We also found that of course, a little bit of semantics goes a long way, but it's important to prepare for open-endedness because you're going to get multiple interpretations. Remember that big sort of a map of our crates that I talked about and uh, there's going to be a lot of extensibility needed. What do we learn about FAIR? That it operates at multiple levels and multiple granularities. So those workflows and RO crates are very composite and nested with lots of dependencies, and each of those components has FAIR uh, properties associated with it that aren't always compatible. And I'm going to leave that to Dan to explain. We also uh, realize that these things are more than FAIR, because if you want to have usable workflows, you also need things like testing and parameter validation and documentation, which don't, strictly speaking, uh, fit in the FAIR principles. Um, and actually, the software paradigm that I think Dan's going to tell you about applies very much to RO crates. RO crates behave like as if they're software. And then finally, what about Dataverse? Well, Workflows have data and software characteristics. Dataverse could easily archive workflows. Um, it could, it could um, and as well as just supporting the data around workflows, the RO create mechanism preserves the metadata and the objects so that you can, where, where will we put things if Workflow Hub uh, disappears? Well, we're going to archive them in things like Dataverse or Zenodo. Um, they're also a really neat way of moving content from one repository to another or one service to another, and, or even to just to point to content without you ever having to move it. Um, and they're a really neat way, it turns out, of sharing reproducible results and methods. Um, uh, because we want to set data and workflows and their metadata free. We don't see why they should just have to live in one repository. They can live anywhere. They can move around. And on that uh, freedom note, I'll finish. And I just have a, a couple of uh, acknowledgement slides. I've finished, Merce. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you for, well, the timing, but also the excellent talk. Uh, you bring it all together really nicely. Uh, include, uh, well, it shows the, the complexity of the entire research uh, well, workflow 
and that, that, it, that it's hard to capture everything just with the data. So you need all these other things, all the context around it, right? To understand uh, what has been done and how you produce the results, but also how do you collaborate and make a, uh, even for oneself or from, from one specific, uh, within one lab, right? How do you make your research more repeatable and uh, more efficient? And uh, yeah, so uh, all very important and relevant to also the growth of Dataverse at, the, at this point with supporting additional digital objects. Um, so now talking about other digital objects, um, code and software, uh, then CATS, is the chief scientist uh, at NCSA and uh, research associate professor in computer science, uh, electrical and computer engineering, at the School of Information Sciences at the University of Illinois and Urbana, Urbana Champaign. And she, he's, he's been working on, on research software for uh, many, many years and is also one of the experts and lead. Uh, leads of the in this area on how to make software more uh, shareable, uh, citable, uh, and uh, how to describe it with software metadata. So then, welcome to the Dataverse community meeting, and we look forward to hearing from you. From hearing your talk, you have twenty minutes. And by the way, for everybody, all the the attendees, well, as then getting ready. Um, if you have questions for Carol, start adding them. In the Q and A, we will have a time for quest for Q and A at the, uh, the end of the three talks. But capture the questions now, so you don't forget them. Thanks, okay. Ben. Great, thanks, Marseille. Um, Yeah, and thanks to the Dataverse community for inviting me to speak. Uh, I, I guess I wanted to actually say, kind of, that I'm going to try to contrast in two different ways from the the, the two talks that we've had so far. And so from Gary's talk, um, talking about where data is and where data isn't, um, all I can say from the point of view of software is, uh, is I wish we were where data is. I think um, software is, is less likely to be cited. It's less likely to be put in repositories. It's less likely to be appreciated. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're looking at data with admiration as data forges a path forward that we're following. So let me um, so let me kind of talk about then how we are moving forward and and by we I really mean a community I don't mean me personally. Um, so I want to start by really saying that that I think there's a, a research and a research software vision that we're working towards and, and again we as a community um, where all research software is open um, all research software is high quality and robust. Uh, all research software is findable, accessible, and usable by others for their own research. And it is cited when it's used. Um, and this means that all contributors to research software are recognized for their work and they have good careers. And that all research software is sustained as long as it's useful and that all research is reproducible. Right? So this is a fairly uh, broad vision in some sense. And I'm gonna talk about two parts of it here. Uh, one is FAIR and how FAIR applies to software. And then the second is citation and where citation fits. And, and so the second contrast that I wanna make in this case to what Carol was saying is, um, is about FAIR. Um, and I wanna point out which, which Carol and I have talked about and she certainly agrees with, even though I don't think it was quite in her, her talk, um, is that FAIR is not a goal, right? FAIR is a, a, a step that helps you get to a larger goal, right? So measuring things if they're fair or not is maybe useful, um, but just making things fair by itself is not really what we're trying to do, right? We're, we're trying to achieve this larger vision of, of better research, better science, um, a better, better work overall. Uh, oh, sorry. And I, uh, I also wanted to say that there are, there are a bunch of other groups that are working at, at a lot of different parts of this. So the Software Sustainability Institute in the UK, RC in the US, uh, the Research Software Alliance, which is kind of a parallel to RDA, the Research Data Alliance, uh, USRC, and other research software engineering activities. So, so there's a bunch of communities, uh, a bunch of uh, organizations that are looking towards other parts of this. But again, I'm just going to talk about the, the FAIR part and the citation part. So on the, the FAIR part, uh, FAIR for research software. We have a working group that's been defining FAIR principles for research software, and it's working underneath Force 11, RDA, and RISA uh, combined because we think it actually applies to all three of these. Um, there's a website here that is uh, available for anybody to, to go to. And I'll also just point out that there's a DOI on the bottom of these slides and 
and that's the DOI of the slides themselves. So you can use that to get to links. Um, this group is led by, uh, by nine of us. Um, and effectively what we've been doing is starting last summer, we formed a bunch of different subgroups to look at different aspects of FAIR for research software. And those subgroups then have come together and we completed a, a draft of uh, FAIR for research software principles. Uh, we've been engaging a community around this draft, initially the community within our group. And we've now moved to a stage where we have uh, an open community review that started last week and was going for about a month. And I'll provide a link to that in a couple in a slide or two. Um, and then we want to um, actually figure out then how do we implement FAIR principles for research software once we have agreed on what the principles themselves are. So again, we, we did this through subgroups initially. Um, so I led a group called a fresh look at FAIR for research software which was looking at the FAIR principles that were originally written for data and trying to say, how do we actually translate those for research software? Um, just starting with the principles themselves, not based on pre-existing work. And there's this nice paper from Annalena Lamprecht that came out last year. Um, and we consciously did not look at that and we wanted to work independently and then compare to it. And so we published a, a document on archive that's a, a fresh look at FAIR for research software um, earlier this year. Uh, a second group that was led by Michelle Barker was looking at FAIR work in other contexts, looking at how the FAIR principles are applied to research objects other than data or software. And for example, this looked at workflows. And so Carol and Stian and a bunch of other people from the workflows community were, were participating in this subgroup. Um, there's a group led by um, Moran Grunpeter that is looking at how do we define research software and, and even how do we define software? Um, and it turns out that neither software nor research software really have good community definitions. And so we, we need to figure out a little bit of a, a scope of how this working group fits within this, this larger community. Um, and so there's a draft report from that out and that should be, uh, there should be a final report out within uh, another week or two. Um, and then finally, uh, Neil Chu Hong led a group looking at research related to FAIR software that's happened since Annalena's paper. Um, so what, what have other groups done, uh, like EOSC, for example? Um, and so there's a draft report from that, which also should have a, a full uh, final report out in the next week or so. So we have been doing a lot of webinars and talks throughout the period of the working group. There's a, a tweet that came out that said we've done at least three events a month, uh, every month this year, which I was actually surprised to find out. Um, but there's nine of us and another few very active community people. And so we've taken turns in leading different things. And this has actually worked out remarkably well, I think. Um, in January and February this year, we did an initial analysis of the subgroup work and this led to a set of questions. Uh, over March, we asked for the, the working group to provide input on those questions. And we published that again as a, uh, as a preprint. Um, the group leads and plus a few other people then held a bunch of writing sprints and we assembled a draft from the subgroup products. And there was a working group review of this initial draft that was last month. And we are now in this official community review and we're doing this as part of the RDA process. Um, and so again, uh, you can get to this from the, the link on the slides and you get to the slides from the DOI that's on the bottom. And this will be open for almost another four weeks. And we really look forward to, um, to a lot of input on this um, because this, for this to be successful, we really need, um, we need it to be something the community buys into as a, uh, as a community product for what FAIR principles should be for research software. Okay, so let me move on then to talk about software citation, the second topic. Um, so we've had a working group from 2015 to 2016 in this area. Um, this group had uh, Arfin Smith and Kyle Niemeyer and I as co-chairs, about 55 members uh, working in both Force 11 and GitHub. We reviewed existing community practices around software citation and developed a set of use cases. We drafted a software citation principles document that started with the data citation principles. Again, data is leading, we're kind of writing on the coattails as much as we can. Um, and then we updated this based on the software use cases and related work and working group discussions and community feedback interview a draft and a workshop at uh, Force 2016. And then we produced a, a paper on this that's in Pear J Computer Science that is called simply Software Citation Principles. And one thing that I'll mention is the reason that we are doing this and the reason that we have FAIR for Research Software is that software is not just data. Um, you can store software as data, uh, you can store anything as data, but that doesn't really actually do anything useful for you. 
Um, and so there are a bunch of unique properties about software that make it a particular kind of data and again, not just data. And recognizing those leads to different principles for how it should be cited and different principles for how it should be made fair. So um, having produced this set of principles, um, which here are here they are in brief, it's, uh, it's importance, uh, credit and attribution as the, the goal of citation, unique identification as a property of citation, uh, persistence, that the thing that you're citing is persistent, accessibility, that it's accessible, and specificity. Um, but particularly for the case of software, there's a lot of different versions, there can be different variants for different platforms, and we want to make sure that the thing that's cited is exactly the version that is intended to be cited. So in 2017, having finished this principles work, we started an implementation working group. And, uh, and, and early that year, we realized that the principles weren't enough. And this again is following the data citation experience. Sorry, my uh, advancing seems to be going slower than I expected. Okay, there we go. Um, and so we started this implementation working group with the intent that we just had a, a little bit of stuff that we had to write out, a little bit of detail, and then this would actually make the principles magically be implemented by everybody. And, um, and there's also, we realized a bunch of research going on about software citation and a bunch of work in other areas, and that we could help coordinate some of these things that needed to be done. Um, and then, uh, yeah, maybe we need to actually work with some of these communities as well. Maybe it's not just writing stuff down. There's actually some, some outreach, some uh, experiments, some, some test cases, things like that. Um, and there's actually a lot of these communities, right? There's, there's publishers and conferences and repositories and indexers and funders and societies and uh, hiring institutions like universities and like, lots of different groups. Um, so, so we started a, 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 this group to do this uh, with Neil and Martin and myself. And again, we're mostly working in Force 11. Um, we formed a, a really good group with a bunch of diverse interests and expertise and in 2018, uh, we realized we had already done a bunch of good work and we had a bunch of good coordination of ongoing activities and, and just some examples of this as we were working in terms of metadata standards and translation. Um, and so DataCite issued a new schema, version 4.1 at that point, that was intended to facilitate software discovery, sharing, and citation, um, really based on some of the software citation principle work. Uh, Caltech Data showed a, a prototype of uh, code that supports code meta so that if you have a metadata file in your repository and you put your code into Caltech data repository, it automatically pulls all that metadata out. Um, and we communicated uh, and developed a bunch of new tools for using code meta. Um, and we did, uh, we worked with uh, Software Heritage, which is an open source archiving and identification uh, project, kind of like archive.org, but for GitHub and GitLab and Bitbucket and everything else, where archive.org is for uh, the rest of the web. Um, and we started doing some work and getting some good initial acceptance in some communities, in particular astronomy and earth science and math and high energy physics. We all had, uh, we had initial projects with all these areas. Um, we though then realized that this small amount of detail wasn't really small and that we were, were making scattered progress, but we weren't really addressing a bunch of underlying challenges. And so we wrote a document that was an, I, I intended to identify what all those challenges are. And again, this is something on archive and it's called software citation implementation challenges. Um, and there's, there's a lot of these challenges. In particular, there's some technical challenges, um, things like Software types are really complex. We have open source software, closed source software, published software, unpublished software, versioned, unversioned, things that are developed by the person that wants to cite it, things that are developed by somebody else who's not the person that wants to cite it, software that's in services or in containers or in executables. And we want to be able to uniquely identify software of each of these types, and ideally as uniformly as possible. Um, and so there was a Force 11 RDA software source code identification working group that looked at this. Um, we want to define and store citation metadata for each of these different types. We need to figure out how to access that metadata and convert it as needed. Um, questions about how we count citations across versions. And what we realized is that the, the primary technical challenges are all really around metadata. Um, how we store it, how we define it, how we convert it, how we access it, things like that. Um, there's also a bunch of social challenges. And these are related to groups that need to work on implementation of software citation in context. 
And so these are things like disciplinary communities, publishers, repositories, indexers, and this is like Google Scholar, for example, uh, funders and, and institutions. And so we need all these groups to come together and we need to start running pilots to establish norms. So having realized that we had these challenges, we actually started work on responding to the challenges. And we started four task forces um, in areas where we thought focused implementation work was needed. Um, and I'll talk about these on the next four slides after this. We also have started talking about other areas that are more complex where we can't necessarily uh, define a sub area, but we have kind of larger challenges. And we received an IMLS grant for a workshop in plan development. Um, and unfortunately, then this got put on hold because of COVID-19. We got the, the funding for this uh, early in 2019, uh, late in 2019. Um, and we're going to have a workshop in 2020, but then we weren't able to. Um, so this is something that we're planning to come back to, hopefully, uh, maybe later this year, but more likely next year. So the guidance task force that's led by Neil Chu Hong um, was working from the basis that we've realized that checklists are an effective way of ensuring consistency and completeness. And so this guidance task force developed um, two checklists that have been produced and started working on a third. So one is for paper authors. And this is basically, you can think of a checklist of how to cite software when you're writing a paper. And the second is for software developers. And you can think of this as a checklist of how do you make your software citable in papers and in other things. And there was also a start on something for paper reviewers, but this was put on hold pending a couple of the other groups. So the second task force was looking at code meta. Again, uh, a standardization that's looking at what metadata are defined are needed to describe software and how do we standardize this. And so the code meta project, which had existed before this, had started off by building a crosswalk of existing metadata standards for software. And as often happens when you're talking about standards, uh, the answer is not that any of those standards are right, but you need another standard that actually um, makes them all uh, fit into something. And so the code meta standard was, was developed um, that describes software based on these crosswalks using elements of each of them and using JSON-LD and, and aligning with schema.org, uh, kind of like Carol was mentioning for, for the work she was doing. Um, so the, the Force uh, 11 Software Citation and Limitation Working Group reached consensus to use code meta as the common metadata standard. And it's now working on how does this get updated to make it complete? And how can everything in code meta be described using schema.org so that code meta becomes a project and schema.org actually becomes the uh, really the schema. Um, and then the, the last piece then is to work on increasing adoption via documentation and workshops and tools. The third so, uh, task force was looking at software registries. And so this is looking at both general and discipline specific scientific software registries and re registries and repositories, sorry. Um, with the intent of improving software discoverability and research transparency, providing information for software citation and, and fostering preservation of computational methods that might otherwise be lost. Um, and developing these resources takes time and there we realized were few guidelines available to help uh, the creators of registries and repositories do this or even existing registries and repositories build new guidelines. Um, and so what came out of this was uh, from the task force is basically a set of practices on uh, nine best practices for research software registries and repositories, a concise guide. And so this is something that uh, the Dataverse also could use or, or other, um, other repositories that haven't actually focused on software but want to add software. And then the last task force is one that I've been co-leading with Shelley Stahl on journals. Um, and the idea here is that journals and conferences need guidance on what authors should submit regarding the software they use. And so working with a set of about 20 publishers, we produced a uh, F1000 research paper earlier this year on recognizing the value of software, a software citation guide. Uh, we publicized this versus a scholarly kitchen uh, blog post um, and through a bunch of different talks and events. And we're starting to see some adoption by the 20 publishers that were co-authored as well as other publishers. And we started tracking this through Chorus, which is a, a community of publishers and they've built a software citation policies index um, that you can go to to see what different uh, publishers are doing and different publishers can use it to see what their peers are doing. And so now that we've done this and we have guidance on how authors should submit uh, software citations on the work that they submit into, into conferences and journals, 
The next step is what do those publishers actually do with that material? How do they translate those citations into machine readable formats, whether that's XML or chats or something else? Um, how do those get transmitted to Crossref so that we actually get them to be indexed, ideally as software? And so the task force is now working on understanding and fixing how this kind of backend uh, publisher processing actually happens and where there are problems today and how we can actually fix those problems. So um, having again talked about fair for research software and, and software citation, uh, just to summarize this, this process of defining fair research software is moving forward where we have community input now open on these draft principles and the next step will be implementation. Uh, I think we've raised the principle of uh, the profile of software citation with a bunch of different stakeholder groups and we've done a lot of good work and it's starting to have effect but there really are a bunch of challenges remaining and the challenges that remain are the hard ones unfortunately. Um, so one of them is that there is a really a sea of identifier types and we don't really have a good sense of how to how to bring these together and where and how metadata should be stored um, really is an amazingly difficult challenge because we have to go across all these different types of software and all these different places that software can be and trying to do something that's common. And then finally, another thing that we're interested in but we're not actually working on actively is, is tracking the effects of the work that we've done in software citation. So can we, have, can we determine if software citation increases over time? And if so, is this due to what we've done or is this just due to the fact that software is being recognized more widely in general? Um, and so I'll, just, I'll actually point out specifically that if anybody's interested in this particularly, um, it would be great to, I'd be very happy to talk to you and to bring you into our group where we have people who are interested, but we don't quite have a lead who has the time to work on this. Um, so this is something in particular uh, that I really would like to see. Um, and then again, just the, the last piece of this is that this is all part of this larger software vision. Um, and if you're interested in supporting this, um, I urge you to work locally where you can and to join a community if, if you can. And these communities could be the Fair for Research Software community, they could be the Software Citation Implementation Working Group, it could be the Research Software Alliance, it could be your local RSE association if you consider yourself a research software engineer. It could be one of the software sustainability institutes in the, in the UK or the US, and there's one in Australia that's uh, just starting to be developed under ARDC. Uh, that Tom Honeyman is leading the effort for, um, or, or really anything else. So, so this is really a place where, where we have challenges, we are doing good work, but we could use more people to come in and help with these challenges. And with that, I will stop and, and take any questions if there are any, or we'll figure out how Marseille wants to handle questions. So, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Then Impeccable timing. By the way, 20. <laughs> thanks for uh, keeping us on track. So, uh, and thank you for, for your talk. First, uh, just reminding us that we are doing all this for better research, better science, and a better world in, so, uh, in, in many ways, right? Uh, not so that, uh, well, all the work that you've done for software, I remember that in a few years, we did a lot of this foundational work for data, and it was a very, it's pain, sometimes painful, but necessary detail, thorough, comprehensive, and you've done a very comprehensive uh, plan to, at all levels, to address all the issues that are software, needs to, to resolve in order to, to get to uh, the state what we've done with data. And even with data, we haven't finished, right? Uh, we need to do more uh, implementation of those, of the principles on citation and, and, and also more outreach and get, so the same we will need to do for software. So thanks for showing us all the work that has been done so far and the, the work uh, that we can also join. And finally, um, the talk by Herbert Van Zompel. Uh, Herbert is now the research fellow uh, dance in, Nether in the Netherlands and a visiting professor at the Internet Technology and Data Science Lab at Ghent University. So uh, over the years, his research has focused in web infrastructure for scholarly communication. And today he will be talking about fair signposting. Uh, thanks, Herbert. Go Okay, uh, okay, thank you, Mose, and thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to talk about uh, FAIR signposting, uh, which really is a new layer of uh, interoperability for um, machine interaction uh, with scholarly objects, which will soon be available uh, in Dataverse, thanks to the efforts of uh, my colleagues uh, at DANS. 
Some of you uh, may know that in the past 20 plus years, I've been involved in a wide range of um, efforts uh, to specify interoperability for scholarly communication. And uh, if there's one lesson uh, that I've learned from all of these uh, efforts is there's a lot of aspects that eventually contribute to the success or lack thereof of a specification. But two things are always crucially important. First of all, they need to address a burning issue and they need to specify an approach that is as simple as possible to implement. Those are two core ingredients of a successful uh, specification, in my opinion. So when I set out um, on the signposting work uh, around 2015 with a bunch of like-minded uh, colleagues, the burning issue that we wanted to tackle was really that we wanted to clarify to machines how scholarly objects present themselves on the web. For humans, there are landing pages that basically show, well, over there is the content, over there is descriptive metadata and so on. For machines, there was or is no such thing. And this was the challenge that we set out uh, to tackle. Simplicity was a core design aspect in all of this. So we decided that we're going to try and do this in the most simple possible way. And this is why we chose links, the core ingredient of the web in actually to try and achieve that. Now we've been doing signposting since 2015 and the FAIR signposting profile is really an implementation guide of how to concretely implement uh, signposting for scholarly uh, repositories. So we'll talk about which type of links uh, you're gonna use. We'll talk about cardinality of links uh, and so forth. So let's have a look at, you know, how a scholarly object typically is presented on the web. So at the left-hand side here, we see the persistent identifier that these objects have. Persistent identifier redirects to the landing page, which is, you know, for human consumption. On the landing page, we find an awful lot of links, some of which, you know, will lead to metadata in one or more formats, some of which will lead to content, more than one uh, piece of content, obviously a possible PDF file, image, software, and so on. And then in, if all is well, we'll find on the landing page also a link to the persistent identifier of the thing. All of that stuff is available. It's only not really legible or understandable uh, for machines. There's also other uh, information pertaining to a scholarly object that could be really of interest uh, to machines uh, and that may or may not be available on the landing page. For example, license information could be, be expressed on the landing page just in text or could be provided as a link to a license uh, URI. Authorship could be just, again, in plain text or could be expressed by means of a link to the ORCID, for example, uh, of an author. And then the type of scholarly object is something that we typically do not see um, in these landing pages. And that is probably because most repositories are homogenous when it comes to the type of objects they store. They're all data repositories or journal article repositories or software repositories. But for a machine, it might be really interesting to actually know what kind of uh, object it is uh, dealing with. So again, the burning issue here was to clarify how scholarly objects exist on the web to machines. So make it easy for machines to interact with scholarly objects as they are presented on the web. And this is a burning issue because the lack that we have now of a uniform interface to scholarly objects requires specific ad hoc solutions for each platform for each repository when one wants to create cross-platform services. 
So think about the poor Zotero and locks, things like that, that need to use all kinds of heuristics that are specific for repositories, need to deal with numerous APIs in order to achieve what they want to achieve. As an anecdote, there's not even a uniform way to determine what the persistent identifier of a scholarly object is from the landing page. And in research I did with my colleagues in Los Alamos, when I still worked uh, over there, we actually found that as a result of that, many, actually for some repositories, majority of scholarly objects are referenced by means of the landing page URI rather than by means of their persistent identifier. Anyhow, this lack of uniformity of interface to interact with these objects makes the barrier to entry for the creation of cross-platform services high. This, of course, leads to centralization because it's hard for new parties to come in and try something, leads to monopolies and lack of innovation. Now, this problem has been around, around for a really long time. OAI ORE addressed this issue around 2008 in a specification that built on linked data technology. This was actually, as far as I know, the first scholarly interoperability specification that used linked data technology. Research of the crate that Carol uh, just talked about also addresses the, uh, this issue in a simpler way than OR, uh, OEI ORE, also using linked data technology and additionally having the capability to wrap uh, uh, objects up in a, a container. Both these approaches actually use a descriptive way of clarifying to machines how a scholarly object exists on the web. And descriptive is of course really interesting, for example, for uh, discovery purposes, but on the web, there's also something else that is really important. It's called navigation. And navigation is what we do when we are on the web, we use our browsers and we jump from page to page. We used to call that surfing. But machines actually also do that. And when machines do that, we call it crawling. And when they just blindly follow links, you know, that is just broad crawling. But when we give them a hand and we type the links, then they actually can follow links and accomplish specific tasks in doing so. Now, this problem also, of course, directly re relates to FAIR as such and to the FAIR digital object and object protocol that I will talk about later, both of which are also uh, quite uh, on fire. Now, FAIR signposting addresses this problem in a navigational, not in a descriptive way. So it's going to provide links that are meaningful for machines so that machines can follow their nose, is what it's called, follow the links to obtain the information that they are after. It uses an extremely simple approach, which is fully standard-based, fully RESTful, and it uses typed web links so core ingredient of the web, links, but typed. And the link types that are being used are all standardized. They're all registered in the IANA registry for link types. And all these link types are defined in formal specification. In addition to that, FAIR signposting recognizes the status quo, namely that scholarly objects are currently represented by landing pages on the web but it enhances this to empower uh, machines. So FAIR signposting profile, as I said, is really a guideline for signposting. It says which re uh, link relation types to use and the cardinality of them uh, and so on. Implementation targets for this are platforms that host research outputs data repositories, institutional repositories, publisher platforms. So this is for all kinds of scholarly objects, not just for uh, data repositories. And as I mentioned, uh, hopefully uh, Dataverse will soon have an implementation. Uh, it is currently in a pull request status, courtesy of my colleagues uh, at DOMS. The profile 
uh, describes two complementary approaches to provide type links, which I will discuss now. One is providing the links by value, and the other is providing them uh, by reference. So here we see that same picture that I showed earlier, but now we've added the link types. So the links that I've shown earlier are still here, but now we're basically saying, you know, on the landing page, which is the core, the center uh, of the representation of the object on the web, we're going to have a described by link, and that is going to point to metadata. And on this link, we can also express a media type to basically say metadata in which format is available there. And obviously we can have multiple of these links. We can point to content resources, the PDF file, the software file, image files, et cetera, et cetera, using uh, item links. And there is a site as relationship that is registered, which allows us to point from landing page to persistent identifier. In addition to that, there's the type link to talk about scholarly object types. And just like, as was mentioned in Carol's and Dan's presentation, we use schema.org types. Of course, you could other, uh, use another typology, but for simplicity, we leverage schema.org. Author links to point to the ORCIDs uh, or ISNIs uh, of scholarly authors. License to point at license URIs. And then uh, here at the last bit, shown in a, a dashed uh, line is the collection link, basically linking back from content resource to landing page, basically content resource saying, I am part of this scholarly object. Now, the dashed line is there for a reason, because sometimes these content resources do not even know that they are part of this scholarly object because they reside in third party repositories, in which link, a case applying this link or uh, putting this link in place is just uh, not possible. But we can handle that in the other way that I'll show you in a bit. So this is what this looks like uh, in reality. You see here an HTTP head uh, get, sorry, that is being done on a landing page URI. Here, the HTTP headers come back. Here you see the content, so it's an HTML page. And in the HTTP header, there is this link field. And there you see the different links that are being expressed. So basically this link here, this here, says that this page here, the landing page, really should be cited as this DOI. And here it has as author this, it is described by metadata in this format as a license URI. It is of type scholarly article. By the way, it's also a landing page. And then there's one item shown here. It's a PDF file. And the same thing we can do uh, in HTML pages. But here we absolutely need to do a get. This information here, just going back to the HTTP link header, can be accessed only use also using HTTP head, meaning there's no content transfer necessary to get to this information, okay? And you can apply this for resources of all media types. This you can only do for uh, HTML pages where you embed the links really in the meta element using link elements in uh, the HTML. And you basically see all the same links the link types that I've shown you earlier. Now there's also a way to provide all these links by reference. And that is a uh, technique is based on the specification that I've been working on for four years with Eric Wilde, who's a web API uh, guru. And link sets basically uh, that what, what is shown here are standalone documents that contain a set of links. They're not only about scholarship, they're just about the web in general. So link sets can have applications way beyond scholarly communication. But in this case, we use them to provide all these links that are now shown in dotted lines. They all go into this link set document. And the link set itself is discoverable from the landing page by means of this link set uh, uh, this link with the link set type. There's two serializations defined for link sets. One is uh, JSON, 
that can also be interpreted as JSON LD when the correct um, uh, context is uh, provided. Now, this link set, of course, is under control of the custodian of the landing page also. And that means that the link that I showed, uh, said earlier, may not be possible to provide the collection link here from content resource to landing page. Well, here, of course, we can provide that link and we can say that this content resource is part of this collection in this uh, link set. And that's what you're going to see in uh, this document here. So this is a link set, very much abbreviated. It only shows two links, really. One that emanates from the landing page. You see, you can see that the anchor is the landing page. Site as is the link relation type. So cite this thing as this DUI. And then we have an anchor, which is actually a content file, which you see here. And that points back to the collection, which is the landing page. And the landing page is in text HTML. And here where the three dots are, of course, there's an awful lot of more links uh, that go, uh, would go in there, the ones that I've shown you in previous slides. So it shall be obvious that this all, of course, contributes to FAIR. It contributes to the F, A, and the R by informing machines what the persistent identifier of a scholarly object is, what the type of the scholarly object is, where and what the content is, where the metadata is and in which format, what license applies, what the persistent identifier of the authorship uh, is. And it contributes to the I, the interoperability aspect of FAIR by providing this information in a uniform way and a way that is interoperable with the web at large. And again, it does this in a navigational rather than a descriptive way. It puts out these links, inviting machines to follow those links to find information that is uh, relevant or could be relevant to them. I mentioned that this also really relates to the FAIR digital object uh, work, which especially in Europe is uh, quite uh, on fire now. Now, FAIR signposting and this FAIR digital object uh, effort actually really share a goal. And that is to provide a uniform interface to digital objects. And the FAIR digital object work actually has two strands. And one of the strands actually tries to define a protocol for uniform interaction with digital objects, which does not use HTTP, which does not use the web. This is obviously a track that I'm very concerned about because it will most likely eat an enormous amount of resources just for the design and implementation because it will use technologies that are not mainstream. And I'm not even talking then about the sustainability aspects that would come later due to the fact that no mainstream technologies uh, would be used there. Fortunately, there also is a track that wants to leverage HTTP and the web in order to create FAIR digital objects. And that work goes under the name FAIR Digital Object Framework. And what you see here is a picture that comes from uh, that specification, which I've uh, cited uh, down here. Now, if this- uh, Herbert, one, one minute. Okay. One, one minute or so. All right, so basically, I'm going to run out of time. I'm not going to be able to uh, talk about all of this. So I'm quickly going to jump uh, from this slide, which will look familiar to what I've presented before, because it contains indeed all the components uh, that I've talked about before. Only here, we are not going to use off-the-shelf technologies and a lot of new inventions are being created. I refer to the specification uh, of this. Uh, for verification. I will show here how all of this can be achieved, what they want to achieve with the FAIR Digital Object Framework can be achieved in the signposting way, because of course, the identifier here resolves to the landing page, 
All these links that they want to provide, they exist. They are IANA uh, registered. So signposting already provides this for you. The link set provides all the links that we need in a self-contained uh, document. And signposting actually even provides more because we also have the license information, authorship information uh, uh, that is potentially uh, being provided. So I've not been able to go into detail about uh, what the FAIR Digital Object Framework wants to achieve, but believe me when I mention that the FAIR signposting profile achieves exactly the same by not inventing new technologies, but by using links, core ingredients of the web, using IANA registered link types, defined in formal specs, by conveying typed links in HTTP link headers and HTML link elements, or in link sets, by using a navigational approach that is usable by very basic web clients, does not require standardization on metadata formats or ontologies, as is essential for descriptive approaches, and does not require centralized infrastructure. Basically, FAIR sign processing provides a KISS uniform interface for machine interaction with scholarly objects on the web by using existing technology only. And so soon it should be available for data first platforms. And that will mean that from now on, all the objects that are stored in your data first instances will be called FAIR digital objects. With that, and these acknowledgements to people that over the years have worked uh, on this effort, I'd like to thank you. Thank you so much, Ben, and uh, um, thanks to all the speakers. And uh, I then, sorry, Herbert, <laughs> thanks to uh, all of you. But uh, I, I have to say that initially the idea of this, uh, the thing, some postings uh, sounded more scarier than it, than it is. And it seems that it's very doable and very uh, relatively easy to implement. And so thanks for explaining it to us. Uh, uh, I would say a virtual or some kind of virtual clap to all of the speakers, first of all, if, uh, uh, thank them uh, in the way you can through the chat. <laughs> If we were all together, we would hear all of you clapping now. Uh, so, and and we we just gonna do a, a couple of questions. If you could, if Carol, if you if you could answer, I know you answered on the Q and A uh, directly there, but if you wanna explain a little bit uh, the question about uh, if arrow creates um, flows being used uh, without bio, uh, with, I mean uh, beyond biosciences. Mm. Ah, okay. So, um, so yes. Uh, so, as I put into my uh, into the, uh, the the discussion, um, there's nothing in AuraCrate or workflows that has got anything to do with any particular domain. Um, so, what you want is is the the need for them really. Um, I'm actually giving a keynote at a conference on social and humanities um, about um, workflows. And I think that is partly in order to be able to introduce the concept of workflows to that community because it hasn't really been perhaps taken as much up as 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 widely as in the scientific domains. Uh, but I think the increasing number of data and the need to process data is emerging in the um, outside of the STEM um, areas. And there you'll see then a, a bigger take up of, of these technologies because there's a need for it. I'm thinking about you know, computational linguistics, for example. I've seen examples in archaeology. I've seen examples in um, sort of particularly where you're processing large scales of data, for example, in social sciences, where you're having to process a lot of Twitter data and things like this kind of thing. So, um, so that's where I've seen workflows um, particularly uh, in, introduced. And ARA Crate is just a packaging mechanism. You can use it for anything. And uh, our colleagues in Australia um, have, have implemented ARA Crate for their um, uh, repository that is dealing with um, indigenous languages which is very much in the uh, digital library um, humanities area. I hope that answered Thank the question. You. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. 
And also, I know that you answered that one, just that, but just so everybody can hear it in case they haven't seen Q&A, uh, that, that suggestion of the error between the workflow hub and Dataverse and the deposit of, um, well, of, of the workflows into a Dataverse repository. So, oh yes, yes. Yeah. So, so oh yes. So uh, and there will be uh, there will be a whole session in. on on this uh, right. There will be a session on that right. That a session on that. Uh, tune yes. in on Thursday where you can learn all you've ever wanted to learn about uh, workflows going into DataVerse um, as an RO crate. Woohoo! Great. Great. And uh, so I think we have a, a couple of other questions for Herbert. Herbert, I guess a, a main advantage about fair sign posting and link sets is that it can be retrofitted into any HTTP based infrastructure and allow new and old formats to come together. Is that, is that how you would summarize it? Is that right? Oh, From that's the end. Uh, absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, I hope from our presentation, it was clear that it uses only the most basic uh, of web technologies, right? It uses links, it uses these type links, and these links are uh, standardized and registered in the IANA registry. So indeed, as document formats and so on evolve over time, you know, as long as we have the HTTP infrastructure, these links that I showed, these type links, they can, of course, point at documents in these evolving formats. It's just about adding the appropriate uh, media type to tell the robot, basically, well, at the end of this link, you will find the content resource. So we're now using the item link. And it is of this media type. So it is of a current uh, media type or of a future media type in the future. So indeed, as the things that we use in scholarship evolve, this is so basic that it can stay with us for quite a while. So yes, that was a very good remark actually uh, from Stian there. Thanks, Herbert, and thanks, Stian. And uh, yes, yeah, we'll hear. Uh, so next question, what is the role of curators in improving the situation and reducing barriers and challenges for researchers with data and software? It was mentioned curator role can be reduced in favor of automation. Is that a realistic goal? When and how does curation uh, curators fit into these automated workflows for storing, citing, and sharing research output? And I think, so Carol mentioned that the automation of metadata because right researchers, data, uh, data producers basically don't like, or data creators don't like to, um, to write the metadata or to, <laughs> so, uh, but I don't know also if then can answer that for software too, but as, uh, so first Carol, could you say a couple of words on that? Yeah, so we, we're working, um... Uh, from the workflow point of view, a lot with our workflow um, management system uh, developers. So uh, to, to see how much uh, metadata can we glean, how much can we actually automate through the process of them designing those workflows and, and running them and through other mechanisms, um, you know, for example, harvesting metadata from tools automatically. Because if you actually ask people to put it into metadata, they just don't. So one ends up one ends up with very nice metadata about all the mechanics of the workflow, but not necessarily about what was the workflow about in the first place and why did you do it? Because, you know, that's a description and you need to write it. So uh, we we try as much as possible to to gather metadata that can be gathered automatically, automatically uh, and, and attempt to minimize uh, the amount of metadata that we ask for that has to be manually entered. Uh, and I, I think that's really the the only way we can we can do it because we don't have uh, any curation ex, um, resources for Workflow Hub, for example. We rely on those uh, folks who are managing their own collections or they're managing their own workflows to do the curating. So um, so that that's basically what we're we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. And then if you want to. Yeah, I, I was going to say that, um, I mean, I, I think in general, I agree with what Carol has said, which um, I guess I could just record and I could have a little button that would play back that little clip of audio and I wouldn't have to keep saying it. Um, but, uh, but specifically, um, 
we, I think with software citation, we actually have an incentive here. Um, so if somebody writes something on GitHub, but they don't record any metadata about it, when it gets cited, they don't necessarily get credited. And so I think we're, we're trying to kind of make that connection that if, you, uh, if you're going to cite software and you can't figure out who the authors are, you cite the project by name. And if the authors want to be cited, then they record the metadata to, to allow you to, to give them credit. Um, so that's kind of the little kind of incentive lever that we're, we're playing with at this point, um, or a nudge, as Carol might say. Um, I, I, otherwise, I think that the, there, is, there definitely is a role for curators where there are curators. Um, and the, I think the issue is that there are, there are repositories and registries that have, um, right, that have curators, and, and those then end up probably with better data. Uh, better, well, sorry, better metadata uh, about the software and data that's in them. Um, but it's probably not practical to have everything be curated in that way. Right? So the, the place where we have, where we can address the scalability problem is the developers, right? because there you have effectively some small number of developers for each project. Um, but when you get to the, the repositories, then you have a huge number of projects and a small number of people, if any, and that just doesn't scale. So, so we, so I think we feel like we have to, we have to encourage the work to be done by the developers and the people that are doing the depositing. But if there are curators and they can help um, improve things, that that's great. And, and where that's possible, it does lead to better results. It just can't be the answer for everything, unfortunately. Right. Um, I would agree with the with that. I would. Let Amber know that uh, she can rest assured that there is a lot of work for curators to, <laughs> still left. And 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 as Dan said, point out. I mean, uh, so one thing is that uh, that we automate as much as possible to facilitate the information that we gather that we would not have any uh, otherwise. But there is a lot of um, for it, for improvement and for uh, adding to that uh, in a way that facilitates their reuse. So. Uh, I think those the one thing doesn't eliminate the other. They can complement each other very well. Okay, and Paul uh, is asking, Herbert, uh, you show three ways to supply the links for a landing page. Which one should be implemented all, or do you prefer one? Okay, yeah. So indeed, I've talked about uh, three uh, ways to provide them, right? Uh, two are uh, by value the HTTP link header and HTML link element. Of those two, I absolutely prefer uh, the HTTP link header. Uh, the reason being that it can be accessed without any content transfer. So the only thing our bot needs to do really is an HTTP head and get the HTTP header back. And in there, the links uh, already show. In addition to that, this is a technique that can be used for uh, resources of any media type, okay? So the HTML link element, of course, can only be done for HTML, but you cannot do it for a PDF file or a CSV file or so on. So HTTP links, you can use for um, resources of any media type. So of these two by value approaches, I'm absolutely more in favor of using the HTTP uh, link header. Now the link set, I very much like because it's comprehensive. Remember that this link from the content resources pointing back to the landing page, in some cases we cannot provide it because those resources are out of control of um, the custodian uh, basically who says this is my research object. So, Link sets, when you look at the profile, are also mandatory in the sense that they will provide a comprehensive set uh, of links. Basically, they provide the entire topology of the scholarly object as it exists on the web in the standalone uh, document by means of typed links. Thank you, thank you, Herbert. And with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll finalize this session. I just want to remind our Sherry Lake is reminding you that there is a curation workflow it's talking about curation and curators, uh, a curation workflow session on Thursday. Uh, so look at the agenda and I'll let, and again, 
uh, thanks to, to the speakers. Thanks for uh, this wonderful session. Uh, lo a lot of some information, a lot of useful information for repositories like Dataverse and for all of us to make, uh, well, a better world, right? Better research and better world. Thanks. And Danny, if you have a final words for just what we do next, and just add your thanks in the in the chat. I wish oh, you could all hear the claps from, <laughs> from everybody. <laughs> yeah, thank you all for the presentation. That's great. And I, I I was I was tweeting. It's it's uh, it's awesome to see a keynote paired with a pull request. So we're, we're really excited to see signposting get into the application. So that's great. Um, yeah. So as far as the schedule, we did have a break planned from 30 minutes after the hour to 45 minutes after the hour. Um, so if we took that break now, it'd be about a minute and a half break. Um, we want to give you all a little bit more time than that. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, just have the break until um, the top of the hour. Uh, when we cut the uh, community videos, those ended up being shorter than we expected. We had allocated 30 minutes for that, so we have a little bit of um, a little bit of wiggle room in the schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and put up a break slide, and um, again, we'll get back together at the uh, the top of the hour. And the sessions will be in this same webinar, so please do not leave the uh, the webinar room. Thank you again for the presentations, y'all. Okay, everybody, uh, we'll go ahead and start uh, again. It's the top of the hour. Um, so thank you for those who stuck around after the great keynotes um, and, uh, and Gary's welcome. Uh, the next hour, uh, we're gonna talk through some, um, some project updates. We're gonna um, have the viewing of the community videos. Thank you to those who sent those in. And then Sonia is gonna talk a bit about uh, some, of the work, some of the sessions that are gonna be coming up um tonight tomorrow and the next day so i'll just jump right in um, for those of you who don't know me um, i'm the product development program manager at iqss um, a lot of the uh, work uh, that i do is related to dataverse because of its size um, a lot of community management um, product management all that good stuff i probably have met most of you but if i have not met you because you're new in the community it's nice to meet you i'm looking forward to catching up on community calls github the google group and all those other um places. So um, whenever I do one of these presentations, I like to you know, start with kind of the idea um, behind IQSS, um, which is better, bigger, faster, and more collaborative science. And so a big way that IQSS does that is to build products and build communities around those products. And so you can kind of see with Dataverse, it fits in really well because these are some themes that you know, the Dataverse really embodies. Um, so what I'd like to really talk about is, you know, kind of a look back. Uh, Y'all can see from my background, I'm still in the same place that I was uh, last year during Dataverse 2020. Um, and I want to, you know, I want to talk about some of the stuff that we've been working on. Um, even though we haven't been able to meet in person, we've been working hard um, as a team, as a community. And so I want to talk about some of, um, some of that stuff. So um, kind of dropping down one level from the better, bigger, faster, and more collaborative science, we have the strategic goals of the Dataverse project. And you can see these on our roadmap. This is our highest level guide. This is what really drives us um, as, we work, uh, as, we, as, as we work on the product, work on the project, work on the human aspects um, of the Dataverse project. And so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kind of talk about a few of these key areas and how they tie into the work that we've done over the last year. So we have this goal of increasing adoption. And you know, we can see that in installations, we can see that in number of users, we can see that in um, collection, a Dataverse collection. So this is one that uh, we've been doing a great job on. Uh, you know, just looking at some of our metrics for the Harvard Dataverse repository, we have been getting huge amounts of data access. We've been seeing increases huge increases. Um, so, you know, as we think about what we're working on, uh, you know, a big part of our time has really been just scaling, uh, scaling the Harvard Dataverse repository and scaling the Dataverse software itself. Um, so this is one where it's not like a, wow, cool new feature, but this is, this is something that, you know, is really a core part of our, um, a core part of our ap application, because if it's not working 
um, well and quickly, then people aren't going to use it. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of we have been successful with that goal, but it's definitely created some challenges as, as we've had to uh, had to scale the uh, the software. So we've been spending a lot of time on performance um, and other optimizations. And one thing that I'm going to also note is that at the begin at the bottom of each presentation, um, I'm going to talk about a session that's upcoming. Uh, where you can learn something. Unfortunately, uh, you would need a time machine to attend the um, installation and deployment of Dataverse installation on a cloud session that was yesterday, but we will be posting that, um, that recording. And so for each of these, I'll talk a little bit about how, we, um, about how you can get involved in you know, kind of looking forward um, with the work. Sensitive data. Uh, so this is one that you know, you've heard about at the last several community meetings. Um, this is one that um, one that we have been able to release um, release some workflows for. So, um, as part of integrations with the OpenDP project, you can learn more at OpenDP.org. Um, we've built a workflow in Dataverse that allows data owners and other authorized users to deposit differentially private versions of their data files, and then make those differentially private version of the data file available to um, people seeking out that data. So, so we still need to build out the OpenDP tool inside of this, but this is, this is looking forward to a workflow where we can have a very basic, um, have very basic support for accessing differentially private statistics through Dataverse. And this allows us to set up that, set up that, basic, um, that basic workflow and the technical integration for our two projects. And if you want to learn more about this, you can attend this uh, sensitive data session tomorrow that's at, um, that's at 3 p.m. And one other thing that I'll note here is that this was built in such a way um, we introduced this auxiliary files framework, and it can really support uh, use cases beyond just sensitive data. The idea, um, the idea about this is that, um, is that th th this is to allow researchers to deposit um, auxiliary files that are not generated by Dataverse itself. And so, so in those cases, we wanna provide a really flexible framework to allow installations to, um, to represent their data in the way that is most important to them. Large scale data. Um, so this is one that I'm really excited about because over the last year, I think we've done a great job of, you know, as a community implementing um, both the ability to get large data in and out of the application, um, but also to provide the administrative toolkit, um, the administrative APIs to actually manage that. And this is especially, the administrative piece is especially important for an installation like the Harvard Dataverse repository, where we, um, we, we are open to the world. And because of cost concerns, we don't necessarily want everyone around the world to be able to upload uh, 15.7 terabytes of files in a data set. Um, but we do wanna provide um, the option for, you know, for certain researchers to be able to upload large data. So um, this is one that you can learn more about in the remote storage and large data set session tomorrow. Um, I even saw a mention of blockchain on the agenda. Um, so it's a really interesting way to learn more about what's going on in the community around large data access flows. And these, um, these screenshots were taken from Arizona State uh, University's Dataverse installation. So if you wanna learn more about what they did, they'll be talking in the, uh, in the presentation tomorrow. Um, improving UX and UI. So this is one where we've been working on data set and file redesign. Um, this is one that we've been rolling out incrementally. And so just a few things I wanted to highlight and thank you um, QDR for the nice words. Um, but you know, we did, we did user testing and we implemented changes based on feedback. We've been, um, we've been taking into account new workflows uh, for accessing and exploring and previewing data and metadata. Um, we've, we've given the preview tools more prominence on the file page to provide a better experience for researchers in the application, and then um, the manifest.txt. If y'all remember, um, in the uh, in, in in the application previously, if someone tried to download a zip that was above the zip limit, they would get a 
partial zip with a manifest.txt of all the missing files. So because we've been able to provide different ways of accessing um, data, like uh, we have a new file access API, we're able to you know, provide a better experience around those large, those large downloads. And instead of you know, kind of getting that, getting that Lego set that was missing a bunch of pieces that you only find out about later, you receive some better messaging about how you can, how you can access the data um, through the UI. And then increasing the quality of the software. So kind of hand in hand with what we did um, for the performance um, of the application, we've been working hard to update the core technologies. Um, during Dataverse 2020, we talked about uh, how we were still on Glassfish and it was out of support and it wasn't, it, and it wasn't great because there are all these cool new things going on in the application server world. And so we completed the move to Pyara and we have a, um, a plan to keep that updated. And we will be, um, for example, in the 5.6 release, we'll be upgrading to the most recent version of Pyara. So we wanna keep that and our other core technologies um, updated. Um, and then like, for example, Postgres and Solar, uh, these were ones where we're starting to come to the, we're starting to come to the end of life. Um, so we've extended that um, well beyond by upgrading those um, those services. And just a quick plug for the um, the recording of the installation and deployment of a Dataverse installation on the cloud. Um, that's one where they'll talk about some of the, or that is a presentation where they talked about the importance of um, of Pyara and what that enables. So to kind of look forward, um, and this is one where it's, it's really easy to get involved uh, because there'll be a lot of sessions about, you know, what to work on over the next year. So expanding data and metadata features for existing and new disciplines, increasing interoperability. I mean, we heard from, um, we, we heard from the keynote speakers about interoperability and standards. Um, so I just want to give a quick plug for two things that we're going to be working on. Um, so geospatial data, um, geospatial metadata. Uh, so there's a few different groups that are working in this area, and they'll be talking tomorrow at 4.45 um, p.m. Eastern. And really the two big pieces are allowing for better geospatial discovery and then to, and then to potentially enable geospatial data previews uh, in the Dataverse application. So. If you want to get involved in this ongoing work, definitely attend that session um, because you can learn more about what the plans are, what some different efforts are in the community. Um, and then similar to flexible metadata and controlled vocabularies, if you all remember uh, at Dataverse 2020, you know, we, we formed a working group. We talked about um, allowing for external controlled vocabularies. So there is a pull request for that now. It's going through review and some, and some other work. Um, and, and that's going to be talked about uh, talked about tomorrow tomorrow morning at nine forty five. And so, if you want to catch up about that and see where it is and talk about some potential next steps, that'll all be uh, talked about tomorrow during the um, during that session. So, similar to the flexible uh, flexible metadata and controlled vocabularies, um, there's ongoing work about being able to better support software in Dataverse. And so, in the last release. We rolled out some, um, some guidance um, for depositing research code. And thank you for the software metadata working group for generating that. And now the next steps there are better software metadata in the application itself, and then workflows for depositing code and making sure that's represented appropriately in data site and other, um, other services. Um, and then ultiple, also uh, multiple license support. Uh, so, uh, if you want to learn more about this, definitely attend the um, the licensing session tomorrow. But basically, one of the one of the longest standing requests in the Dataverse software has been to better support multiple licenses. Um, and so it's really exciting. You know, Don's is supporting this work through the GDCC, um, and and installations will be able to set up a configurable list of licenses so that the data um, can be represented appropriately um, for their use cases. So this is one that's really, really exciting. And then Harvard Data Commons. Um, so I know Merce has talked about Data Commons um, in a few different venues. So 
we are working on this um, at Harvard. Kind of the big pieces of that are about those um, about those scientific workflows that were talked about during the during the keynote. Um, so we want to do a better job of representing that in data in the Harvard Dataverse repository and the Dataverse software itself. Um, we're, we want to allow in, allow researchers to move more easily between Harvard Research Computing and the Harvard Dataverse repository using Globus as a piece there. And so we're really excited to you know, continue talking with Scholars Portal and building on their work. Um, and then the other piece, um, so Harvard's digital access to scholarship system, that's, um, that's Harvard's uh, DSpace instance. And so we're gonna better integrate um, between that and also um, Harvard's digital repository service, which is the, um, which is the preservation system. So we're gonna be setting up some of those, um, some of those integrations with those other open source systems. And we're of course gonna be you know, building that back into the software itself. So this is something we're also, we're also gonna be working on over the next, uh, the next year. And you can see the list at the bottom there, all these good sessions where people can talk about this upcoming work, figure out how to get involved, how to contribute. And then this is the rest of the uh, stuff that you know kind of didn't fit in in other spots. Um, embargo, speaking of long-term, uh, lo lo long-standing community requests, it's really awesome to see Embargo um, being built into the software. Again, this is also supported by, um, by Don's through GDCC. Um, signposting, you know, I joke that we get to, get to pair a pull request with a keynote. Uh, so signposting is there. Uh, in, in a PR waiting, um, waiting for review and merge. Um, we're gonna revisit some of our workflows for depositing and linking um, data sets and collections um, just, to, just, to figure, just to figure out how, how those experiences can be a bit more, a bit more smooth and user-friendly. Like for example, if, if, you, link, um, if you link a Dataverse, uh, you, can't, you can't delete that link. It requires administrator intervention. So, just some of those things that you know kind of elevate um, linking um, in, in the application, revisiting some of that. And I talked about the very basic integration that, um, that was added to support um, opendp.org tools. Uh, so we're gonna um, talk about the next steps of that and how we can, how we can integrate that into the, uh, into the Dataverse software. Um, trusted remote storage agent integration. Um, this is one that we've talked about and you know, basically the idea is that we need to support cases where data is too large or too sensitive to be in Dataverse itself. So we need to work on some workflows and some, um, some, some uh, UI aspects that, that support the cases where a metadata record is there, but the data itself is not. And so also paired with trusted remote storage agents, we would like to modularize um, the ingest process. Um, this is necessary, um, or it is desired, because you know right now that ingest takes place on the application server, and so by modularizing that, we can support ingest of larger data, and we don't have to we don't have to have as many system stability concerns. So that kind of goes to that performance aspect as well. And then um, building external tools for upload, as we you know are looking at um, as we're looking at the Globus integration. Uh, what we're seeing is that um, you know we're reaching the point where if we're adding these additional upload methods, we really need to think about to think about providing an external tools framework there because it'll be very challenging to just build all of these into the application itself. Um, and then similar with request access, as we start to support more sensitive data and just as we support different workflows around request access, we need to look at modularizing that and providing um, an updated architecture there to support those use cases that are very different from institution to institution. And then performance work, uh, we're expecting our, um, the loads on the Harvard Dataverse uh, repository to continue. Um, so we need to keep, um, keep, keep finding those areas of the application where we can, um, where we can do some work to uh, make things run more quickly or more robust. Um, and then, you know, it's not really a, it's not really like a product thing, but it is foundational to everything that we do. Um, and so increasing contributions from the open source development community. A lot of y'all 
are already contributing. Um, so that's awesome. Um, so those of you who are not contributing or who, um, who uh, are already contributing. Um, so the different ways to get involved, creating GitHub issues and participating in discussions on those GitHub issues. Um, the GitHub backlog has gotten a little bit unruly. I acknowledge this. Um, one of my commitments over the next year is to um, wrangle that in a bit, um, do some consolidation and some closing of those GitHub issues. But we do read everything that comes in. We do appreciate all the comments and, you know, we, and like a, a bug report is just tremendously valuable um, because, you know, again, we build this, we build this together. And so, you know, it is important to hear all of the issues because if you're experiencing an issue, it means that um, it means that there's another installation or 70 other installations that are experiencing that same issue. I mentioned the Google group, um, the community call, um, working groups and interest groups are, that's a kind of emergent, um, emergent theme in the Dataverse community. Um, and I'm hopeful that because of these sessions and I link kind of all the sessions at the bottom here, I'm hopeful that these sessions will, some of these will kick off working groups, some of these will kick off interest group. There already are ongoing working groups and interest groups. So I definitely encourage y'all to get involved. Um, pull requests welcome. If it's something that's really simple, just make the pull request. If it's something that is a, a bit more complex, let's talk first, um, whether GitHub or Slack or any of the uh, usual venues. Um, and then one of the really neat things is that because this external tool infrastructure has been built out, um, there are a lot of opportunities to get involved, not in the core uh, code base. Uh, so whether it's building an external tool or contributing to something like PyDataverse, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to, uh, to get involved. And then just a reminder, um, you know, community pull requests go through the same process that the um, pull request generated by the team go through. Um, they just go through, they go through code review, QA, get merged, included in releases. And so if you want to keep up with what we're going, um, what we have going on, definitely check out the, uh, the project board. Um, so thank you uh, to all of you. Uh, you know, it, it's funny, you get those, those emails where it says, hey, this was an unprecedented year. Um, it, it certainly was. Uh, so, you know, again, I have the same background that I did last year. Um, but I hope uh, soon that we can all be together. And thank you all for everything you do to make this a great community. Big clap for Danny. That was wonderful. Great. So, um, so next up, the community videos. So Dwayne, it looks like, um, are you a host? Are you able to share? Yes, yes, I am. Maybe an opportunity to say thank you to Duane for all the work <laughs> uh, done that we don't see the, to put this community meeting together. Hi, diverse community. My name is Matthew Harp. I am the Research Data Management Librarian and Director of Research Data Services at Arizona State University's ASU Library. I am pleased to introduce you to ASU Dataverse, our interdisciplinary research data repository. You can find us at dataverse.asu.edu. Launching in October of 2020, we are one of the newest members of the Global Dataverse Community Consortium. Our development team is led by Jeremy Kurtz and includes Deirdre Kermis and Kirk Manigold. We are also privileged to be joined by Stacey Erdman, who helps keep us on track with our overall repository and preservation programs at ASU. Our sponsors include Associate University Librarian for Technology Services, Deborah Hankin Kurtz, and University Librarian Jim O'Donnell. We also work closely with our partners in ASU's Office of Research Data Management, led by Philip Tarrant. We implemented our Dataverse installation in Amazon Web Services Cloud, utilizing several of their services, which allow for increased security, future scalability, and improved data storage management. But most importantly are the datasets. 
The COVID Future Study is a project to understand how people expect to change their travel behavior after COVID-19, and was one of the first to deploy guestbooks at ASU. This data set has already been accessed over a thousand times. At 17.4 terabytes, the United States Regional Climate Change Assessment Project is exceptionally larger than all the collections the ASU Library has published over the past decade. We set up a large file store in our installation that can be chosen at dataset creation that utilizes the Dataverse Direct Upload API, and the user was able to upload almost 100 files varying in size from 150 gigabytes to 365 gigabytes each. March Mabel Madness, the successful NCAA-inspired tournament, is another example. The team behind the program wrote an article and wanted a stable interlink portal for the related scholarship, educational materials, to the underlying data. Thanks for listening. The ASU Dataverse team is attending, so we would love to talk with you. You can find us at dataverse.asu.edu. Hi, I am Marion Wittenberg, Service Manager of Dataverse NL in the Netherlands. Until present, DANS had his homemade, discipline-independent data repository EASY. Besides EASY, we offer Dataverse NL, the platform service which allows universities and research institutions in the Netherlands to establish their own repositories. But with the need of a technical upgrade and our good experiences with Dataverse NL, we are in the process of migrating our legacy repository to Dataverse. Multiple instances of Dataverse, referred to as data stations, will be customized to the needs of various disciplines and research communities. Each station is assigned a data station manager who will establish and maintain contact with the research communities. In addition, Dataverse NL will continue to exist as a platform service for universities and research institutes. Data contained in the data stations and Dataverse NL will automatically find its way to the DANS Data Vault, a secure, reliable and certified long-term preservation repository. For our new data stations, we developed several contributions to Dataverse, like signposting, support for embargo and licenses, and controlled vocabulary support, and the connection to our long-term preservation vault. Our CTO, Wim Hugo, will tell you more about the DANS technology vision. Hi, my name is uh, Wim Hugo. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for DANS and I quickly want to give you some background on our technology vision and the activities that we foresee in the, in, in the future. Um, we are, of course, in the process of migrating our legacy repositories to Dataverse, but this forms part of a larger initiative uh, for interrelated programs that uh, also include uh, a new R&D function that will look at thought leadership and innovation, uh, more structured and focused engagement with our end users, uh, the community and other initiatives, and the development of value-added services and infrastructure around our core repository workflows and functions. And on that note, we believe that uh, much of this will be uh, driven by automation in future and that uh, these workflows increasingly will be distributed and federated.
Hello, Dataverse community. My name is Caitlin Newson, and this is a quick update on what's new with the Scholars Portal Dataverse repository. Scholars Portal Dataverse is a bilingual Dataverse repository for Canadian university libraries, available in French and English, and is currently used by 59 subscribing institutions across Canada. Our repository currently contains nearly 4,000 data sets and is using Dataverse version 5.1.1. In 2020, Scholars Portal released a new version of the Data Explorer. This external tool connects to Dataverse to enable exploration of tabular data files, including the ability to view variable level metadata, summary statistics, and variable groups. Users can also generate their own cross tabulations within the tool. Scholars Portal has been continuing the development of an integration between Dataverse and Globus, a large file data transfer tool. This integration will allow users to upload and download files larger than the 2 to 3 gigabyte limit to Dataverse through a Globus endpoint that is connected to the Dataverse system. An external tool will serve as the front end of this integration project, which will allow users to upload or download files to and from the connected Globus endpoint. To learn more about this integration, check out the remote storage and large dataset session. Throughout 2021, we've been continuing to test the migration of our storage from the file system to cloud storage. We have connected Dataverse to OpenStack Swift Storage, which makes use of Dataverse's built-in S3 storage connectors. OpenStack has S3 emulation, which allows us to use S3 APIs in OpenStack. We're continuing to test this integration and hope to move to production soon. We've also been working to support our members who are interested in Core Trust SEAL certification in partnership with the Portage Network and the new Digital Research Infrastructure Organization, members of our team are working with our community to develop policies and documentation that will help subscribing institutions acquire certification. Thanks for your attention. You can contact our team at dataverse at scholarsportal.info or check out our repository at dataverse.scholarsportal.info. Hi, Dataverse community. It's really a great pleasure to talk about Data Repositorium. The Institutional Data Repository of the University of Minho launched early 2020. This Data Repository is a service integrated in the RDM strategy defined by University of Minho in 2018. It's a component of an infrastructure to support RDM practices in the University of Minho community. Data repository will not solve all needs identified uh, in MINU, but for sure will contribute to unlock the many limitations felt today by researchers in our university, and will also contribute to the degeneration of good practices in data management and sharing. The three main pillars of our repository are share, publish, and manage. Promote data sharing and open science practices, make data available for reuse and greater impact, and ensure do good documentation and good data management practices. This data repository was the first Dataverse installation in Portugal. Greetings from the steering committee for the Texas Data Repository. The institutions that are part of the TDR include Baylor University. Hi, I'm Christina. Texas A&M University. Hi, I'm Laura. Hi, I'm John. Hi, I'm Johan. Texas A&M Galveston. Texas A&M International. Texas State University. Hi, I'm Diana. Hi, 
I'm Laura. Texas Tech University. Hi, I'm Matt McInerney. Guns up. <laughs> At Texas Women's University. University of Houston. Hi, I'm Reed. University of Texas at Arlington. Hi, I'm Hamad. And University of Texas at Austin. I am Colleen and Jessica Trilogan also says hi. And I'm Courtney Muma. I'm the deputy director of the Texas Digital Library, who is the home of the Texas Data Repository. And Anna, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, my name is Anna Pichenina and I'm from the University of North Texas. The steering committee has been very busy this year. We've been doing a lot of work with training and outreach. We've continued our webinar series. We're also doing a lot of work with larger data sets and continuing the work with the core trust seal. We've been integrating preservation and we've done a, a carpentries pilot. We're also working on an R integration capstone project we have a lot of future plans for 2021, 2022. We're very proud to be part of the Dataverse community and we look forward to working with everyone in years to come. Hello everyone and welcome to the Harvard Dataverse repository. Once again, we're very happy to see all of you here for the Dataverse community meeting. So this brief video is going to talk about any updates to the Harvard Dataverse repository. First of, uh, and foremost, we want to thank Merce for her leadership and support throughout all of these years on the Dataverse repository and the Dataverse software, and we want to let her know how much she'll be missed. So going forward, the Harvard Dataverse support website continues to grow in content and services. So I think I mentioned about a year and a half ago that we created the support website for the Harvard Dataverse repository in particular. We want to highlight that our curation services continue to be used and we have quite a number of projects lined up for services by um, Harvard and some non-Harvard affiliates at this time. We will be adding to our curation services, services to help manage collections within the Harvard Dataverse, apply for Core Trust Seal certification as part of the Harvard Dataverse repository. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, briefly. We wanna to continue to highlight, highlight our COVID-19 data collection. This collection continues to grow as more and more data are deposited related to COVID research into the Harvard Dataverse repository. This is actually a linked collection, as you can see. So every time someone deposits data into the Harvard Dataverse repository, it's automatically linked into this larger collection that we created. We also wanna highlight the China Data Lab Dataverse, which is collecting data and presenting webinars and training workshops around COVID data collection and resources on COVID data. And we also want to highlight the DASH, which is the Digital Access to Scholarship at Harvard, uh, sponsored by the Financial Administration Office for Sponsored Research at Harvard, with its collaboration with the Harvard Dataverse to bring in data related to publications that are published in DASH related to COVID. Our goal is to make sure that all Harvard scholars who have publications related to COVID have deposited their publication in DASH. And when that publication is deposited, we have also uploaded their data to the Harvard Dataverse and connected the two with bi-directional linking. We are also in the process of working on an integration between DASH and Harvard Dataverse. We can't forget to give you an update on data tags, the tool for sharing sensitive data with confidence. So we continue to work on an integration between data tags and the Harvard Dataverse to be able to support sensitive data in our repository. You will get an update on data tags during the webinar uh, webinars of the community meeting this week. We are very happy to announce that we are applying with a new model for generalist repositories for the Core Trust Seal certification. So we're very much looking forward to completing this application before the end of the year and getting some of our collections certified. For Harvard affiliates, let's not forget the Research Data Management Program, which connects the Harvard community to services and resources for the research data lifecycle offered by the Harvard Library. 
the Harvard Biomedical Research Data uh, Group at the medical school has also created a new DMP tool for you to create and share your data management plans to meet funder requirements. Be sure to visit the website and take advantage of their tutorial and get started on your DMP. Thank you very much and I look forward to seeing all of you during the community meeting this week. It's great to hear from everyone. It would be better to hear from everyone in person, uh, but you know, it's great to hear all the cool stuff that's going on in the community. Um, and like I said in the chat, to see some some new faces as well as some uh, as some familiar faces. That's awesome. Cool. So uh, our our next um, the next thing on the agenda is uh, Sonia. I think you're going to just take us through briefly what's going to be coming up on the next couple of days. Uh, in uh, for Dataverse 2021, so I'll uh, I'll hand it over to you. Sonia, you are muted. I'm always muted when I start. <laughs> uh, so thank you everyone for joining us for the 2021 Dataverse community meeting. It's great to see all of the old people and all of the new people that have joined the community since our meeting last year. Uh, so I'm just going to talk about what's coming up in the next few days so that you're ready and prepared for all the awesome updates and news and sharing that we have uh, to contribute this year. So tonight, just so you know, there is a session on the GDCC and governance, which is going to be done by Merce Croesus and Jonathan Crabtree. Um, the session is going to be open to all members and others who are interested. So if you want to attend, uh, I hope you've registered and that uh, you can get on board. Um, if you didn't register for any reason, let us know. Just contact us. We'll see what we can do. Um, and that's tonight. And also uh, know that there's an identical session of this that's going to take place in the morning. So tonight, today is Tuesday here, six o'clock. Tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., there will be a duplicate session of the GDCC governance that you can attend. Um, tomorrow morning, also starting at eight o'clock, we have uh, breakout sessions uh, to discuss some topics of interest to everybody here. Um, the core trust seal, uh, there'll be a core trust seal panel from eight to 9.30. This is going to be talking about the core trust seal certification, which um, you heard some about in the Harvard Dataverse repository presentation that some of the Harvard Dataverse or the Dataverse community members um, have presented about in the past week in the open repositories conference that took place. We will have a session from 9.45 to 11.15 on flexible metadata and controlled vocabulary. It's going to be following the discussion at the Dataverse community meeting of 2020 and talk about ongoing efforts and future ideas for improving fair support of the Dataverse software, focusing on metadata schemas and controlled vocabularies. We will also have a session at 1130 on remote storage and large data sets. It's going to cover the need for affordable large data support. Um, currently, there are a lot of constraints due to the cost uh, of the bandwidth for um, from cloud storage. And so we are going to talk about some challenges and possible solutions to um, this issue. We will also have a session in the afternoon on the terms of use, licensing, and installation policies. So we want to expand the ability to add more licensing options um, and terms to the Dataverse software. So that is what this group is going to be talking about, the high quality access to data outputs and published research objects, depending on the repositories clearly defining their terms and license for reuse. Of course, we're going to have a session on sensitive data. As, you, as I mentioned in the Harvard repository video, uh, we plan to support sensitive data in the Harvard Dataverse repository with the integration of the data tag tools. Well, there's a lot that comes uh, um, with sharing sensitive data, and this session is going to cover some of that information, including an introduction to the DP Creator overview of the management of sensitive qualitative data and health policy research data. And we're also going to get an update from Harvard Medical School's DMP tool and how it can help the community prepare to share sensitive data. There'll be another session in the late afternoon on geospatial data uh, with ideas for supporting geospatial previews in Dataverse. It's going to highlight the current efforts and provide a forum for the discussion of geospatial data support within the Dataverse software. Later in the evening at 6.30 to 8 p.m., which is late for us, we're going to talk about integration and external tools. 
The external tools framework were, uh, was originally designed to connect to the software, uh, to tools that preview, explore, and curate data sets. And we're gonna talk about the examining additional ways to link intersecting projects and enhance what's possible within the Dataverse ecosystem. And that's all taking place on Wednesday. Now on Thursday, we continue with the breakout sessions in the morning at 8 a.m. with software metadata and containerization. We're going to talk about the support for computational artifacts such as software, workflows, and containers needed in the data for software to meet the advance of all of those advanced data analysis um, to enable research, reproducibility, and reuse. In the late morning, we'll be talking about preservation. This main question of the session is, what are the relevant preservation practices designed to ensure that data in Dataverse is usable for as long as it needs to be? And for anybody who has been following Philip uh, Conzet on Twitter, he talks about the need to talk about preservation in repositories and how his group is already working on something like this. So if you're interested in contributing to this, please make sure that you hit up Philip. In the early or later morning, we're going to talk about curation workflows. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about how to make data more easily discoverable, better understood and reusable in the Dataverse software. Uh, there are many levels of data curation. So we'll talk about what's acceptable, what's not acceptable and what we should be striving for in the Dataverse tool. And of course, we'll have our closing session in the afternoon, which is going to be led by Danny Brooke. So we hope that all of you can join us for these sessions. Again, if there's a session that you did not sign up for, but you are interested in joining, please reach out to us and we'll see how we can get you uh, into those sessions. And I'm all done. Great. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't uh, like when, when we first scheduled this, I said, you know, 12 hours is gonna be a long time to attend presentations on Wednesday, but like looking at the, the speakers and looking at the content of those presentations, I'm a, uh, I'm pretty excited to show up at 8 a.m. and uh, stand here. I, I am standing for uh, 12 hours. Um, so it sounds like next year, uh, Dataverse Community Meeting is gonna be in Barcelona. So Merce, thank you for putting us all up um, at your house. Uh, that'll be exciting. Um, I will include my, uh, my email address in uh, the chat. Um, if you're here, you're probably registered for the meeting already. Sorry, the, I'm talking this year's community meeting. Um, but you know, as as Sonia mentioned, if there are people in your um, in your community uh, that would like to attend any of the sessions, please reach out to me, and I'll be happy to um, get y'all registered for the um, for the sessions coming up over the next couple of days. Um, so with that, um, I'm Merce, um, Would you like to take any time to answer questions or or say anything? We have. Uh, about 13 minutes still scheduled before our scheduled end time. So we could take questions or if you wanna say anything, it's up to you. Mm, thanks, Annie. I, I was not prepared for that, but I'm always happy to, uh, to talk and, uh, <laughs> and, and get questions from, the, from this lovely community. I, I guess I would just say that uh, all of you, rest assured that in, you're in very good hands. Uh, here we have a wonderful Dataverse team at Harvard, but uh, I think more importantly, of course, the one, the, the team at Harvard, uh, like says at Harvard is dear, dear to me and very important, but I think that even more importantly, all the community, that it's all of you. So, and this uh, is clearly strong and it continues and we, you, anybody, you're going to do great things in the next years and many years ahead. So uh, yeah, I'm happy also to to answer any questions, if there are questions. I was sort of kidding, but not kidding. Who knows, maybe there are Dataverse community meetings all around the world. Gary already mentioned, maybe we should do a tour of uh, all those places that um, all of you have a repository, Dataverse repositories. So uh, we, ne we need to get started, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, and Catalonia has already some diverse installations oh, that will be 
I think uh, um, published soon in the in the map. So if they are not yet, so, so we can do that. Uh, if there are no questions, uh, really all of all of you, thanks for being here. A lot of good sessions ahead. Don't miss them. Contribute, participate. That's all. But it's uh, this is about. Want to hear from you? Great. Well, if there are no questions, you know, again, if questions come up, we're going to have a lot of um, sessions in which to ask the questions. Um, and then anything uh, that is um, anything that's still at top of mind, we will have some time in the closing session to uh, to answer questions. Um, so thank you all. Uh, and uh, thank you all for attending the keynote presentations, hearing the product updates, seeing the community videos. Um, and looking forward to uh, a few more days of Dataverse 2021. Um, and looks like the next session is in about five hours. <laughs> so thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.